Good evening, sorry for the delay. Welcome to the Candidates Forum for a Town Council at Large Candidates, sponsored by the Amherst League of Women Voters in partnership with Amherst Media. My name is Jessica Ryan and I am the spokesperson of the Amherst League. I will be moderating this forum tonight. The mission of the League of Women Voters is to encourage citizen participation in government and influence policy through education and advocacy. We welcome you all to join us. This meeting is being recorded. The forum will be rebroadcast by Amherst Media and available for streaming. Please check their website for details. Election day is November 2nd. Early in-person voting will be available during business hours from Monday through Friday of the preceding week with evening hours on Thursday. Absentee ballots may be requested until October 27th. For more information, please visit the town clerk's website. We have six candidates running and in no particular order, they are Vera Duonami Cage, Mandy Jo Haneke, Andrew Steinberg, Alicia Walker, Bob Greeny, and Vincent O'Connor. If you have a question for the candidates, please type it into the Q&A box on your Zoom screen. We will have time for only about six questions tonight, so we apologize in advance if we don't get to yours. Remember that you can find more information about the candidates on Amherst Media and the town's online bulletin board. In addition, the League will publish an election guide in the Amherst Bulletin the Friday before Election Day. The format for this session is as follows. There will be no opening statements. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to respond to each question. The session will end with two minute closing statements from the candidates. So let us begin with the first question. We are now three years into home rule charter. The values identified by the Charter Commission in 2017 were as follows, citizen participation, representativeness, demographics and interest, effective, deliberative and efficient structures, accountability and transparency, a clear voice for Amherst, avoidance of big money politics, a culture of tolerance and respect, strategic and long-term planning. Given those values, how would you assess the first three years of operation under the Home Rule Charter? How could the council do better? So we will begin with Ms. Cage. Thank you, Jessica. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Amherst League of Women Voters, for having us here tonight. I am very... Um, interested in this question because um, there hasn't been um, much transparency when um, there was a vote to get open, um, to revise our open meeting, um, my opponent, uh, Ms. Haneke voted against that. Um, that was around providing documents um, that are part of um, these uh, town council meetings. Um, and so on, on that particular issue, I'm disappointed. And also representation. Um, the first group of uh, folks that um, came on board with the uh, to represent us in town council isn't representative of our community. And I'm here to change that by running for town council at large to be able to represent all of Amherst. Thank you. Um, next, Ms. Haneke, would you care to go next? Thank you. Thank you. Um, as with any change in government, there have been positives and negatives as it relates to what the goals of the charter were. Um, I think when you think about deliberative structures, we have done a pretty good job with that. Um, that doesn't mean it can't be improved, but um, one example is the zoning that's going on where the zoning has had its public hearing. Some of the required, you know, the planned zoning changes or proposed changes have had public hearings. We've heard those questions. We've heard the, the people, and then we're actually going back for more public hearings because of all the changes we've attempted to make since those public hearings because of the um, feedback we've received. And so I think that deliberative planning has has been better, especially as it relates to zoning. Um, even though it's a very controversial issue. Um, transparency is always tough. There's it can always be better, but we've tried. Um, and in terms of participation, we've seen better participation of the community. That doesn't mean it's the best, but we've seen better compared to 
a, the prior structure where we didn't get as many comments. Um, as a representative town meeting member, I rarely received comments on what I had to vote on, and now I always do. And so I think it's done a decent job um, and in um, abiding by those, those goals. Great. Um, Mr. Steinberg, would you please go next? Yes, um, I've been very pleased with how uh, the charter has come to life. Obviously, with any new form of government, it's taken a lot of work and it probably needs to continue to always take work. Um, having been a member of the select board before, um, I have found that I have heard from more constituents on virtually every issue and um, I have seen more participation in government than I have ever experienced um, before. And uh, I think the other thing that I have noticed and have been proud of is that this has been a very hardworking um, council and uh, that uh, the council really put in the effort to hear from the community, and to uh, have um, real, real understanding amongst all members about what it is that is before the council and the factors and the decisions made. I think we've uh, had a great um, level of mutual respect amongst councilors. And um, so I, the council process, um, has worked well and I think has forgiven us the government we were looking for. Ms. Walker, would you please go next? Um, I think that ultimately the charter did not do the greatest at accomplishing its goals of at least transparency and increased civic participation. Uh, my first experiences with um, interacting with town government was as the co-chair of the CSWG. And it was particularly difficult navigating the town government because we didn't actually have the information as to how the processes worked or what participation could look like or when it was actually necessary to participate and voice certain needs. Um, I think that also there are a lot of barriers to participation, like access to language, technology, and just basic information as to how the processes work. I think that the main focus of the council should be to represent the interests of people across the town and to ensure that all voices are represented and that we're meeting all needs of the community, but that this can only happen if we can increase transparency and access to the information that the community needs in order to advocate for themselves. And we need to do this by finding solutions that are rooted in the needs of the most marginalized community members by establishing two-way dialogues with the community so that they can, so that we can make sure that they not only understand um, the new policies, bylaws, and programs in the community, but that they are also an integral part of its formation. Thank you. Mr. Greeny, would you go next? So we, we have the council. I don't think it's <clears throat> been very successful. Uh, speaking as someone who's not on the council, I, I feel like sending a letter to uh, Mr. Steinberg is not a very meaningful way to be included in town government. It's a very anemic, <laughs> kind of participation. And I have tried over the past three years to get into a meaningful position where my voice might have leverage on real policy formation and, and I have not been able to do that. So holding public forums is, is not the way to get real participation. People of diverging views have to be included on policy forming committees and, and their voices really need to be um, part of the deci decision making process. And I don't think, and this is not necessarily just a council problem, this is a systemic problem where we're not very good. It happens at my institution where I work, it happened with the old system of select board, um, we need to be better at including the unheard voices and making people feel 
that they are part of the decision making. Thank you. And finally, Mr. O'Connor. Mr. O'Connor, would you care to answer the question? Mr. O'Connor, can you hear me? I can hear you, go ahead and answer the question. We'll try to, to solve that problem. Um, let's move on to the second question. In 2019, the town council adopted the goal to reduce townwide greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by the year 2025. How would you prioritize and or support this goal? So let us begin with Ms. Haneke. Well, one of the ways I've supported the goal is to vote in favor of um, funding the two projects that will eliminate the use of fossil fuels in two of our library buildings. Um, those are, you know, one of them is one of the biggest buildings, municipal buildings in town and eliminating the fossil fuel use in that building will definitely help meet our climate action goals. Um, you know, meeting those goals is going to be extremely difficult, um, but that was the point of adopting the plan and the goals. And so other ways to prioritize, we need to look at when we fund capital projects, what we're funding. And we've started doing that on the council with um, funding reduce reductions in vehicle okay. use okay. and things like that. Um, and in terms of fossil fuel vehicle use and anti-idling technology that is electric based and things like that. And um, we also have to address somehow find a way to address our retrofitting of buildings in town, because the only way we can meet our 2050 goal of carbon neutrality is to retrofit all of our existing buildings um, in terms of getting them off of fossil fuel use. And that's going to take state, federal, and local action to figure out a way to do that. Ms. Walker, would you please go next? Yeah, so I think that um, I want to start off by first saying that we need a counselor who can look at everything with the racial justice and climate justice lens. We have many excellent tasks in the CAARP report. And so as a counselor, I do support the implementation of that report. And I would work on delegating the tasks of that report to certain individuals to carry them out. Um, we would make a timeline to indicate when these things need to be done by and figure out a specific reporting mechanism to be able to keep track of the task and its implementation. And so I think that this will take um, holding ourselves, the town manager, the entire town accountable to lowering our carbon emission and that we might be able to create something like a community dashboard where we can monitor these things together to create a greater sense of community and like we're reaching towards our goals together. Um, Amherst can do things like before they spend money, they can make an entire report as to if there was a more climate friendly option and if there was why we didn't choose that one um, and so keeping track of things in that way will allow us to really track and monitor progress towards our goal to ensure that thing, these things happen and to in include the community in a way that makes them feel a sense of success as well. Mr. O'Connor would you like to go next? Okay you have to repeat the question because I came in after the question was asked. No problem. In 2019, the town council adopted the goal to reduce townwide greenhouse gas emissions by 25% by the year 2025. How would you prioritize and or support this goal? Well, I think there's a number of steps that can be taken. Um, the first is to use some of the federal money to assist both single family homes and multifamily residents uh, to insulate, um, to retrofit buildings um, that have been 
recently constructed. Maybe they're well insulated, but they certainly do not have any kind of carbon neutral technology um, that are heating or cooling or lighting those buildings. And so I think we have to look at that. We have to involve the community, neighborhood by neighborhood, because there is no way that a project of this nature is going to be handled effectively by a centralized town hall program. And I think if we, if we involve neighborhoods, if we involve people in the process, we will, have, we will be much more likely to succeed even at the initial goal um, than we would otherwise. Thank you. Mr. Greeny? Uh, well, I think everyone that's spoken has included pretty much everything that I would say. I, I think we have widespread support for this goal. It, unlike many of the problems we have in town, this is not a controversial goal. And, um, and so we need to, as we should on any issue, harness the collective wisdom of all people in town. And there are a lot of people that have much more expertise on this than I do uh, and, and implement those suggestions. So I, I don't think I have anything more to add. I'll stop short. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Cage, you're next. I'll give you some concrete suggestions. Um, get police cars off the road. I understand that they consume a lot of, of gas um, for idling around, for driving around for no reason. Um, second, I would reevaluate the library project. Dumping a whole bunch of debris, tons and tons of debris into landfill is not the way to go. Um, I would make sure that we elect counselors and hold counselors accountable um, to be responsible agents to mitigate climate change. Um, I did my research and um, my opponent, uh, Ms. Haneke, in response to a uh, Sierra Club questionnaire, candidate questionnaire, stated that she was unsure. She was unsure for what? She was unsure that um, to the question of, um, let's see, would she oppose um, gas um, pipelines into our communities, um, gas or oil pipelines into our communities and her response was unsure. So we need to elect candidates who are serious about climate change and not find loopholes like the library project to push forward, thank you. And Mr. Steinberg. Um, well, I've been involved with this uh, goal for before it was a goal uh, because we have a zero net energy building um, program and there was a, um, it was actually went through town meeting twice and in between the first and second time, there was a committee of eight people of which I was a member that took a concept um, bylaw and worked very hard as a collaborative group of uh, town and Mothers Out Front group to uh, make it a workable uh, zero net energy for town buildings. And um, I'm proud of that work that we did, which is a statewide model. And the library project does fit in that. And um, there is, uh, uh, calculations that have shown that the amount for the um, disposal of waste is minimal compared with the tremendous gain that would be had by getting rid of the um, building as it is now, which is the largest user of natural gas of any building in town. Um, we're working now with the Energy Resilience Plan 
the housing plan, the affordable housing plan. I think all of those um, plans as we implement them, give us further opportunities to achieve um, our energy goals. All right, the next question is, how can we encourage more people to turn out and vote in local elections? And Mr. Steinberg, I'm gonna bring it back to you. Um, well, certainly the League of Women Voters is doing its part by um, all that it is doing for this election. Um, we have uh, made some tremendous strides this year because uh, we have uh, created four ways that people can vote. And um, we have tried, I, I, I'm hoping that the word is out that there are the uh, early voting days, the ability to still apply for ballots by mail, absentee voting as always, and um, we have the voting locations still for each precinct um, with uh, uh, the same voting places as in the election one year ago. Um, but in the end, um, uh, this and other um, mechanisms, uh, programs that inform our voters about what it is that they can um, what each candidate offers um, is the best way to move forward. Mr. Greeny, would you please go next? So, the first of all, we need more candidates. <laughs> uh, too many elections this time around are um, uncontested. So that certainly doesn't, but uh, happily, this particular race is well populated and has a diversity of voices. And so I think the at-large election is gonna galvanize and energize and the presence of people like Alicia and reaching out to her community in Vera um, will, will, will have a powerful effect on increasing voter turnout. But beyond that, we need to just get people in general engaged in meaningful participation in government. And that will spread to their families and their friends. And people will have a greater sense of connection and participation with the government. And that will make them want to vote as well. So those are all things that would have a, a strong impact on voter turnout. Ms. Haneke. Thank you. Um, one of the easiest ways to increase voter turnout is something that the state needs to do, which is to create universal mail-in ballot where what happened, um, which goes even farther than what happened last fall, which is every voter always gets a ballot mailed to them. If you're a registered voter, a ballot shows up in your mailbox. We have a problem in town where many people don't even know an election is happening, particularly our students who rarely leave campus um, and signs are not on campus. And so having a ballot arrive in your mailbox with some voter education materials, I think would go a long way to increasing voter turnout in this town. Uh, same day registration, the same thing. Um, if you can show up on the day of an election instead of um, and register instead of needing to register 20 and finish that registration 20 days before an election, which if there are primaries in this town, um, which for local elections there wouldn't be, but for state elections there's primaries, that deadline is before students have moved into their buildings. So they're, they can't even register. So same day registration is another important way. And then just voter education and starting to educate people that local elections really do matter. Um, you know, everyone focuses on national and state elections, but local elections really do matter. And, and getting that education out there and explaining why is very important too. Mr. O'Connor. Well, I think the first thing is to have candidates who speak to the concerns of the people who live in the town. You can have all the mechanisms you want, but if people don't feel listened to as they probably do not have, do not have the feeling that they were when 900 people signed a petition, 
uh, for a moratorium and the, the two incumbent uh, counselors, at, at large counselors, uh, voted against it. Um, and then 1,100 people signed a petition uh, to have a referendum on the library project. And the two incumbent counselors, both of whom have legal training, as I understand it, um, stood by while the manager and his staff uh, dealt with those petitions in an absolutely improper way, and they covered up the impropriety. That is not going to encourage people to participate in local government if they see that their efforts to do so are going to be turned aside by the people who hold elective office. So the issue is not mechanisms. The issue is the substance, the citizen, and the turning aside of participation by the incumbent at-large counselors, which they did. Ms. Walker? I think the main way that we can get mo more voter turnout is by activating young people, BIPOC people, and people who have been disengaged from town government and getting them to engage. Uh, we have to provide education about how the decisions being made by the council impact people's everyday lives and support them in realizing their power and how they can display that power by voting. I think representation on the council is equally as important for residents to feel like there are people in these positions who understand their experiences and will advocate for their needs. We need candidates and council members who will focus on building authentic community connections where they listen to what is important to the residents and what challenges they may be facing in this town. We need to work on eliminating barriers to participation, which again, I said are like language barriers, access to technology, maybe even thinking about accommodating times for public comment or finding other ways in which the community can engage with us and to access knowledge. Um, and so I think that there are people who continue to engage and who have been engaging and the way that we can get more turnout is to engage those who have been typically, dis who have been historically disengaged. And Ms. Cage. I would agree that you certainly should be offering um, candidates, whether they're incumbents or, or new candidates, um, something exciting or a reason for people to show up to the polls for. Um, and it's my duty and responsibility to educate the public about what's at stake. You know, it is about money. It is about resources. It is about BIPOC communities missing out on a lot because we're not at the table. And when we do exercise voice like Ms. Walker has through the um, Community Safety Working Group, oftentimes the proposals, the sentiments have been dismissed, disrespected, and ultimately um, not upheld in any meaningful policy changes, shifts, or budget allocations. And that's why I'm running for office to get those who aren't engaged right now to have a reason to be engaged. And it's about holding people accountable. So when I look up and I speak to people's records, it is about accountability and um, transparency and um, public education. Thank you. I just want to remind our audience that questions will go to all of the candidates. So for our question number four is, how are you going to represent all voices in the community? And if we could start with Ms. Walker. So I think that my main goal as a counselor is to be able to represent all voices, especially those who have been typically disengaged. Um, and so again, I think that one of the best ways to do that is to create a two-way dialogue with the town, a way in which not only we can be providing access to resources and information that they need to make the best decisions to be able to advocate for themselves, but in a way that they can also ans answer, quest ask questions and get answers quickly, where they can provide 
feedback and input. Um, we should invest in things like drop boxes in community so people can drop their ideas in if they don't have time to engage. We should invest in things like um, there's technology for texting where you can send out mass texts that alert people as to when there will be meetings or in which ways that they can be engaged. And so I think that looking at these specific things and really investing in these things it is what will bring our community to the next level. Mr. O'Connor? Yes, um, well, for very close to 40 some odd years, um, as a town meeting member and a resident of the town, um, I have, Listen to people who had concerns. I have helped people get through the town government process. I have assisted people in bringing things to town committees and to town meeting. Sometimes people who I am on the exact opposite of the political fence, but they ask me for help in process. They ask me for help in particular issues, and I help them. I think that's that's the the essence of what a counselor at large has to do: be willing to be to be responsive to every citizen who has a concern, to help them figure out how to get that concern to the proper place. We need, we need committees that aren't just big grab bags. We need specific committees of a council who citizens can go to and express their concern, public works, public safety, public health, and not just a big grab bag. We need rules that encourage citizen suggestions and response by the council. And that is the only way that real engagement will take place. Mr. Greeny? Um, people of diverse views need to be included on all the meaningful policy forming um, committees of the town. And the one that I'm most familiar with is the planning board, which is a, 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 a very crucial and elemental committee. And um, it appears to me, and I think a lot of other people in town, that the planning board is populated by a group of like-minded people. They're highly professional, they're qualified, they're good people, but there's not a diversity of thought. And when people of opposing opinions have applied, they don't seem to get appointed. So this doesn't, what it does is it brings people to the forums to complain. <laughs> and so the public forums end up being these big complaint sessions. And then the people in power say, oh, they're just a bunch of complaining people. And they don't, more often than not, those things expressed in the public forums are not in a meaningful way included. So. I don't want to, I sound like I'm complaining. I am complaining. I, I want to change the system. I want to make sure that all voices, a diversity of voices is included. Ms. Cage. Can you repeat the question, please? How yes. do we engage all residents? How, how are you going to represent all voices in the community? Well, certainly when the question came up about the, um, the new group that um, would replace the community safety working group, um, some people thought, oh, the intention was to BIPOC, to Black. And I think that's a, a failure of understanding um, institutional racism and how we remedy that. And the community safety working group has painstakingly put together proposals to address um, how do we be actually become an anti-racist um, community. And for a town councilor to um, object and say, oh, you know, this particular initiative sounds like it's not serving all community members. It's a failure to recognize that there are 
huge segments of our population in this community, in this town, that's not benefiting from all the money that's being doled out and spent in this community. How many businesses are businesses of color in this community? How many residents have untapped talent that we as a town can help um, ignite and, and to support, right? So I'm about that change in how we um, distribute money in this community. I'm about defunding the police and I'm about providing, putting resources where community members need it the most. Mr. Steinberg? Yes, thank you. Um, I think this is an important issue and I appreciate it. And I appreciate the comments that have been made about the Community Safety Working Group and its successor um, committee, which was discussed at the last council meeting. I think the two very valuable points were made and listened to by me and I hope by the rest of the councilors. Uh, the question of making um, the participation ratio, um, uh, make sure that BIPOC voices are really heard on this committee because it is an issue um, that uh, I think is uh, one that is appropriately merits a concern. And the other that hasn't been mentioned is to try something that we haven't done before and we are looking into now, which is the possibility of stipends. I think it was a reasonable request. And um, I, I think that that study of uh, whether we can move forward stipends moves forward. Other things that we need to do is uh, um, address language barriers and make sure that um, we have staff uh, or um, others who are available when needed to make sure that language is not a barrier to participation in town government, because ultimately we need to get people on committees because getting people involved in all of our committees is a way that they learn about government and can join and participate. And Ms. Haneke. Thank you. Um, Representation means a lot of things. Um, as a town councilor at large, we are elected by the entire community and we need to represent the entire community. But that requires knowing what the entire community thinks of, about a particular issue. And so all of the answers that addressed um, how we get more people to engage in the council's work are absolutely accurate because without engagement, it's hard to identify and figure out where the community stands as a whole on any one issue. Um, but representation also means that, you know, we need a diverse pool of people on the council too. Um, and that requires um, that the council figure out a way to lessen the workload of the counselors, because right now it's hard for certain members of the public to even be able to um, commit the time. We haven't, as current counselors, I will admit, we haven't done the council a service in having six hour meetings twice a month. Um, and so we have to figure out a way to reduce some of those meeting times because it really is a barrier to representation in town government. Um, but how do I span when I'm trying to think about how to vote? How I, You have to be able to span differing views there. And that is a tough thing to think about. And I work on compromises a lot in terms of having to be able to represent those varying views. Thank you for our next question. What can town council do to retain existing small businesses and attract new ones? Do you support a new parking garage? And we will turn to Mr. Greeny first. Hmm. Um, I am not convinced that the current plan for a parking garage is the best one. Um, like any other decision, there is a sense amongst a lot of people that not, there hasn't been enough inclusion of diverse voices into that decision about what that where that parking garage should be and what and what 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 size or what it should look like so um 
one of the things I think that would enhance our downtown business is to try and bring back the more diversity of businesses that we used to have of local businesses. And so a lot of people, and I'm not the one as an individual to solve this, like solving the, the loss of, of um, neighborhood houses and the loss of housing to student housing and how to solve our small business problem. But I think if we include the wisdom of many stakeholders, we can come up with a way of bringing back that sense of small local businesses like the Henyon Bakery and the Black Sheep Deli and those kinds of businesses. This is a tough problem to solve. And I don't think parking is the only part of it. Mr. Steinberg? You will need to unmute yourself. There yeah, I'm available, so thank you. Um, they, they're both very good questions. The challenge for small businesses is very difficult because of a couple of factors. And then we get to the third one, which is COVID. Uh, we've had a problem all along because um, the nature of retail has changed. The nature of uh, how people use retail has changed and that was a problem. The second was rents in downtown. Um, as the value of property in downtown has increased, uh, the rents have gone up. The one thing that was uh, very helpful for many, many years was the carriage shops, but they were in such bad shape as a physical building that um, the owner uh, just couldn't do renovations and continue to maintain it at, at the price point where he was renting. And uh, I exercised the best option that he felt was appropriate for his, um, for his business interests. Um, the parking garage uh, is something that I don't think we're going to uh, jump into yet. But uh, Northampton has been very successful in its parking garage. Uh, and we know that a lot of things like the Coming Drake um, Music Center and the cinema need to have a place where people can go and know they can go to park. Ms. Cage? Um, it's, it seems, appears that there's, um, with re respect to the garage question, um, the immediate uh, controversy is building a garage behind where the CVS is. And that's in a residential community and um, I'm opposed to building there. I agree with uh, a member of the planning board who stated that um, there needs to be more planning. Um, why that location? Let's consider other locations. Um, and uh, a, a parking garage um, is not the solution to our problems in Amherst with our businesses. Um, part of the problem is that we have the same people running the show. Um, you see the same names on different new initiatives and you can't just get, you, you can't be, you can't expect um, success um, because you're, you're just working with the same people. So I would encourage the people who um, are running the show to not be afraid of new voices, of new people, of new ideas. Um, and that their particular ideas and initiatives, while they may be great, um, should have, um, should incorporate other people from very divergent communities and um, experiences and vantage points. Um, so yes, I'm, I am opposed to the garage um, that's um, thought to be built behind the CVS parking lot. And I would hope that the town council would respect the residents that abut there. Thank you. Ms. Haneke? Yes, thank you. The town council is our legislative body and we approve a budget. And I don't know what legislatively we can do to technically attract small businesses other than change zoning. And I'm just gonna say that because, um, you know, we don't build as a town, the people who own the land build. Um, and so what we can do is try and 
through our zoning indicate what we want built by what we allow to be built and what we don't. And the town council's undertaken some of that attempt to do that with our mixed use building proposal, um, the planning department's mixed use building proposal that would require 40% of um, the first floor be retail or non-residential uses. Right now in the downtown area, that's zero. You know, a, an ATM, people like to say an ATM could constitute a mixed use building and the rest of the floor could be um, residential. And so we're looking at things like that through the zoning that might be able to um, create the types of buildings that would attract small businesses uh, to the area. Um, in terms of the parking garage, I don't have much time, but there is a proposal out there. That proposal was at a hearing um, to rezone a parcel of land. Um, the council, the planning department and the sponsors heard the people and they are coming in with a new proposal that I have heard um, is much more acceptable to the residents of the area. That's deliberative planning. Mr. O'Connor. Well, uh, first, I, I would not um, support an, another failed parking garage. And I would say the first one failed because it generated 30 additional spaces from what was there before for $6 million. And if the proposal to remove the parking in the front of town hall is, uh, is uh, t taken, we will have had a net loss of parking since the parking garage was created. So uh, another failure I think is a really bad thing for the town to do. The second thing about small business, um, the council appoints people to the planning board. Obviously, um, the incumbent at-large town councilors have, have not um, sufficiently communicated to the individuals that are nominated that we need to change the mixed-use building thing. Um, that, that, that zoning thing is a joke. We have destroyed 15 to 20 small businesses in one small area alone um, by, the, uh, by the decisions of the planning board. And that, those decisions rest on the, sh the heads of the, the counselors who approve those members. And Ms. Walker. Uh, my approach to downtown development is rooted in community engagement and participatory process. The community must engage in a process of reimagining what our ideal downtown looks and feels like. We must ensure that all voices are represented and that our downtown area serves our collective community through an equity lens. Our town must buy into a shared vision of our downtown community as a place where everyone feels a sense of belonging and including visioning activities and decision-making processes would not only give the community a creative way to engage with the council, but it also gives the community an opportunity to work across constituencies with a common goal. I believe downtown Amherst should be a place that is inviting to all of its residents and I support the opening and retention of diverse businesses that are representative of the different identities and cultures that exist in this town. I remember walking downtown as a kid around the carriage shops where a variety of locally owned shops were congregated. They had a barber shop, the Roots, a sneaker store, a bead store, the mercantile. I remember that's where the block party originated and that is what community feels like. It is welcoming, inclusive and full of life. I think we need to do more research and planning in regards to the parking garage because businesses definitely said that they need park in, parking, but I'm open to looking at all of the options. And I think we can find a solution that meets the needs of all parties and takes into consideration all of the other moving pieces. Okay, and we're moving on to our final question. Aside from building additional large apartment buildings and complexes, what creative solutions would you suggest to help mitigate the housing issue? And we will start with Mr. O'Connor. I think the first solution is um, our, we don't have a, we have a housing problem because of the university. And in terms of general 
housing needs, the university, instead of demolishing as we speak, the 300 units of family housing that they uh, link um, in apartments and North Village, they should be held responsible for, they want to increase the number of students, they should provide the housing. We should not have LLCs running all over town, buying up single family homes to house six, eight, 10 people. Um, second, some, we have some apartment complexes like uh, Gilreath Manor on Hobart Lane that have continuously for decades been bad actors. I proposed once that we take that apartment complex by eminent domain and I will, I will propose it again if I'm a counselor. And those, that apartment complex has 14 units of three bedroom uh, condos. Those would be very appropriate for family housing. We should buy into other condo uh, apartment complexes and to house fam- low income families and individuals. But, and that's my solution to the housing problem. Ms. Cage? I think our town needs to pay closer attention um, and work with the Amherst Housing Authority to make sure that, um, look at our waiting list, um, increase Section 8 type vouchers. Um, We should explore rent control. Um, We should uh, explore um, building, renovating, um, and expanding um, affordable housing. projects um, such as the Ann Whalen House um, needs a lot of um, renovation. I don't know um, if any of you all have um, stepped foot in there um, and visited some of the floors. It's in really bad condition and I think as a town um, we need to do a better job serving um, seniors on fixed income, people who are on disability, you know, it's it's such a, a tale of two cities, the the town of Amherst, right? Um, here we can support um, thirty six point three million dollar building projects, and you know, just down the street, people are living, you know, in conditions that we can do much a much better job um, improving their situation. And look at our community center, right? The Bangs Community Center needs a lot of help. I think we need to scale down the library project to make sure that there's money left over for other critical needs in our community, like affordable housing. Thank you. Ms. Walker? Um, Expanding affordable housing is a top priority and a main concern for many Amherst residents, um, as well as those who may be considering reallocation to the area. The town can do things to address this, like add incentives for landlords to provide affordable housing units and to ensure inclusionary zoning, which will allow the expansion of affordable housing and to ensure that that happens in some of the mixed use buildings downtown, which I think could also be a creative solution to revamping and adding more foot traffic to downtown and to add more business or more prosperity to local businesses. We need to look at adopting housing bylaws that require maintenance and upkeep of rental housing units, including apartment buildings and single family homes. And we have to establish housing dedicated for year round Amherst residents. And we can do that by negotiating things with UMass uh, for them to accommodate more of their student housing needs on campus. The town also used to have a human services director that actually offered certificates for low income families. And we need to figure out a way to provide these trauma informed care services to the community in a way that is accessible for them. um, And in a way that allows us to address the affordable housing issue. Mr. Steinberg. Yes, I've been uh, proud of a lot of the things that we've accomplished in um, affordable housing. And I uh, bring that up because it's a model of how we go forward. It's a matter of uh, trying to find partnerships that can work together, being creative, 
looking where there's town land that might be available, finding other nonprofits seeking grant money using Community Preservation Act funding. Um, all have uh, succeeded in getting a us uh, uh, keeping rolling green as a habitable uh, as a low is something that has subsidized um, um, and low income housing availability to it. Um, the things that we were doing with East Street School and out on Belcher Town Road, 132 Northampton, uh, using uh, tax credits for uh, North Square and getting deeply subsidized build um, housing at North Square. Um, these are all things that. Uh, we have done, but continue, and we need to use, use those models to continue to move forward. Um, I'm, I'm pleased that we have made a change in the inclusionary zoning and have forced the newest um, proposed uh, uh, mixed use building to require that it have inclusionary zoning units. So it's a matter of us um, finding every resource we can and working collaboratively to get there. Ms. Haneke. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm proud that we've adopted changes to the inclusionary zoning bylaw that will require all new developments that have 10 or more units to include affordable housing. That's an important step towards mitigating our housing crisis, especially the affordable housing crisis. Uh, stricter rental registration regulations. Um, right now, there are self-certification -certifi on um, whether you've whether the landlords have complied with the building code and all. We need stricter regulations on that, maybe independent inspections and all. Um, we need um, actual fines that are enforced if you're not registering your property for rental registrations or if properties are violating certain bylaws. Um, we need to look at changing our rental registration program to make it a little more strict. Um, you know, we have in town a lot of single family homes and a lot of apartments and some types of housing in between. We need to figure out a way to build housing in between apartments and single family homes so that um, anyone who wants to live here in whatever living situation they want can find an appropriate housing situation. And that will require some zoning changes. Um, you know, it's it's tough, but I think we can do it. We need to advocate at the state level for more funding for affordable housing too. And Mr. Greeny. So I think this is a, a great example of a diversity of voices creating a diversity of ideas. So if you, if I made a list of all the things that have been mentioned by all the people here, we have a really good starting place. Um, and, and none of them are really new ideas, but I think what we need, because we're not moving fast enough, is, is a, a, an amplified effort on all of these things. The only item which has been missed, not entirely missed, because um, Ms. Haneke just mentioned it, there's an area between single family residences and apartment buildings and I remember going to a, a planning board subcommittee meeting where uh, Maria Chow called it the missing middle. And so it's that area of duplexes and triplexes that we need to figure out by zoning, by regulation, by incentive, like Alicia was talking about, how to stimulate the local market to develop this kind of housing. And some of it could be the retrofitting of single family homes into owner-occupied duplexes. And an owner-occupied duplex allows the owner to make some income to pay the taxes. And so working class people can afford to live in town without subsidies because they own a building. But how to make that happen is a challenge. Thank you. We're now ready to for our candidates closing statements. Remember, these will be two minute closing statements from everybody and we'll begin with Ms. Cage. Hi, thank you for having us once again, um, League of Women Voters, Amherst and the viewing audience. Um, my name is Vera Penjuang Minnie Cage. I humbly ask for your vote November 2nd. I've been endorsed by the Firefighters Union, the um, 
Progressive Coalition of Amherst and Amherst Sunrise. I'm here to fight for public education. Um, we shouldn't be cutting into our school budget um, and we shouldn't be um, risking our safety by not providing safe staffing levels for our fire department. Um, and there's a lot at stake and I want people to really do the research on on us and on um, some of my opponents who are running in this council at large race. Um, Ms. Haneke has opposed uh, the uh, vote on reparations forming that committee. Um, she's also unsure several years ago about whether to um, support a gas or oil pipeline into our community. And I also want to, um, you know, have this community reevaluate um, the people who are currently um, on town council and the direction that we're going in. I think that people have been um, participating and engaging um, in high volume and high numbers through um, uh, petitions um, that get dismissed, ignored, and have to go to court and, and we incur expensive um, lawyers fees. And that's not uh, the, the town that I want um, to live in. I endorse um, Ms. Walker's candidacy and I support the vision that she has um, that I share for our community, which is a shared vision where everyone gets to participate and have a voice. And I also want to have a vote. So thank you um, for your time and attention tonight. Thank you. Mr. Greeny. We need renovated schools, updated libraries, a new department of public works, a fire station. We need to address a plethora of housing issues with strategies that include, but are not limited to, large apartment complexes. We, the delay in achieving these goals is not a lack of resources, but a lack of listening, inclusion, and participation. Two thoughts. The wisdom of the many is superior to the wisdom of the few. Second, the inclusion and participation of divergent views in planning and decision-making lead to better outcomes. We struggled for 15 years to renovate our elementary schools, not because a small number of people objected, but because differing views of large numbers of parents, educators, and citizens were not given voice and agency in the planning process. We argued for 10 years how to renovate our libraries not because a small number of people objected, but because the differing views of large numbers of community members, library lovers, <laughs> including former library trustees, were not given ample voice and agency in the planning process. We struggled with marginal success to mitigate our housing shortage with a diversity of housing options, including affordable housing at all levels and the preservation of historic housing, diverse family-friendly neighborhoods, and our treasured New England character. Because our town council and planning board are not welcoming and including the participation of divergent views in their planning, zoning, and policy making. Thank you. Mr. Steinberg. Yes. Um, well, I first I again want to thank the League for organizing this forum. I'm seeking re-election as Councillor at Large, as a member of the uh, and chair of the former Finance Committee and a member of the last Select Board. I provided knowledge about town government process and issues during the first years of the Council. As we transition to the second Council with some new members, I look forward to making a similar contribution. My experience and approach to service helped me to study and analyze complex issues. For example, after months of study, I voted for the Jones Library project. It will provide children, teens, and English as a second language learners with appropriate space. It will help our climate by eliminating the use of fossil fuels. It will be accessible for people with disabilities. And it will not cost Amherst taxpayers more than we will need to spend 
just if we repaired the current building. It will not jeopardize our financial ability to support a new elementary school building. I will continue to carefully study every issue and listen to all comments. My goals of, as a counselor are to assure sound financial management, provide the best town services possible, including our schools and libraries, and to maintain our quality of life. To increase the size of the budget, we need new development. The center of town provides the best opportunities for growth, but poses challenges. Therefore, an additional goal is to assure that downtown development fits a community vision for our town centers. I appreciate the confidence you had in me in three previous townwide elections. I hope that you agree with my vision for Amherst and have confidence that my experience will bring that vision to life. Mr. O'Connor. My thanks to the League of Women Voters for organizing and presenting this candidate's forum and to our audience for their interest in bettering this community. O'Connor, candidate for counselor at large. Those who are interested in reading more of my ideas and proposals to move this community forward should go to my Facebook page at Vincent J. O'Connor, where various documents will be posted within the day. The election for at-large counselor turns on whether the voters think the two incumbent candidates have been leading us in a good direction. I do not think they have, and I have made clear on Amherst Media and other areas where they have failed, why, and what I would do different. As a, can as a candidate for at-large counselor in Amherst Tuesday, November 2nd general election, I have been endorsed by the Progressive Coalition and Amherst Sunrise. Because one person cannot bring about ch change, I urge our listeners to vote for the two other Progressive Coalition endorsed at-large candidates, former school committee member Vera Duwamani Cage and Amherst native, Alicia Walker. Finally, I urge our listeners to vote no on the library project. Our schools should come first and they have not been placed first by this city council. They have not, they, the, the council has tried to do and be everything to everyone. This is not good government. You have to make choices as a counselor. You have to put things first. And this council has failed to do it. And the, and the at-large incumbent counselors need to be replaced. Ms. Haneke. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you to the League for hosting us this evening and to Jessica Ryan for moderating. If reelected, I'll continue working towards implementing a comprehensive, responsible funding plan and timeline for the major capital needs of our schools, the Jones Library, Central Fire Station, and the DPW building. I've already begun by supporting the funding for updating our library for the 21st century. If reelected, I'll continue working to address the housing crisis in Amherst. Some options I will explore include stronger regulations regarding required inspections for obtaining a rental registration permit, net zero and green building requirements for both new buildings and retrofits, guiding new housing growth to areas that minimize the impact on Amherst's open space, easing permitting requirements for duplexes, triplexes, and townhouses in town, promoting infill development, and finding ways to collaborate and partner to create student housing in appropriate locations in town. In doing this, I will seek to pass form-based zoning, otherwise known as design guidelines, in order to make sure that the new buildings fit into the character of their surroundings. If re-elected, I will continue moving ahead on making Amherst a more equitable town. And if re-elected, I want to continue advancing Amherst towards meeting its aggressive climate action goals and reaching carbon neutrality by 2050. My experience and leadership has served the council well these past three years and will continue to do so if I'm reelected. If you put your trust in me, I will continue working hard to represent you and all of Amherst's residents well. 
In addition to voting yes for the library, please vote for me, Mandy Jo Haneke, for town councilor at large when you vote this fall, either by mail-in ballot, voting early at town hall, or voting on November 2nd. Thank you. And Ms. Walker. Um, I want to thank you all for having me here today. My name is Alicia and I use she and her pronouns. I am a mother, a lifelong resident and an active community leader. I am a low income tenant, woman of color and young parent. There are many of us and we do not see ourselves, our experiences or our interests represented on the current council. Amherst is missing out. Imagine what we could build if we had a diversity of perspectives and experiences at the decision-making table. I want to leave a legacy of amplifying the voices of BIPOC, immigrant, low-income, first-time homebuyer, renter, and other traditionally marginalized community members who have long been disengaged from town governance but are most impacted by the decisions the council and others make. We have so much untapped potential. There are amazing people on the ground, building community every day whose work goes unseen. We need someone who is ready to govern with and listen to our communities. We have the opportunity to do this now. And so I invite you all to join me in reimagining what an equitable and sustainable future might look like. Together, we can make way for a better, more inclusive, an anti-racist Amherst, please vote for me and for Vera on November 2nd. Thank you to all the candidates for participating in this forum, but especially for being willing to represent the citizens of Amherst in our local government. Remember to visit Amherst Media to view the candidates' short presentations there and to look for their statements on the town bulletin board. And be sure to pick up a copy of the Amherst Bulletin on the Friday before Election Day for the League's Election Guide. Thank you so much for all of our uh, viewers, and thank you again to the participants. Good night.